Welcome everyone to Going Through House of the Dragon. My name is Triple S and in this video I'll be talking about the second episode of the first season, The Rogue Prince. I'll be going through what I like and dislike about the episode, what I feel it does better or worse compared to the source material, and I'll also bring up anything I find interesting or noteworthy enough to mention. There might be spoilers for other media related to the Song of Ice and Fire series as well, so you've been warned. With all that said, let's begin. Right off the bat, I was correcting my wondering of if the Game of Thrones theme which played over the credits of the previous episode would be used for the intro sequence starting with this episode. Now I'm wondering though, if it will be used for all A Song of Ice and Fire shows, like the Jon Snow spin-off. I guess time will tell. Rather than flying around the world showing us the locations that will be featured in the episode as the intro sequence of Game of Thrones did, House of the Dragons intro instead flies through the model of Old Valyria's capital city which Viserys has made following many flows of blood, ominous. This is so much worse than seeing that dead woman's body covered in crabs at the start of Jaws. Ugh. So it's been half a year since the first episode and Lord Commander of the Kingsguard, Ryan Redwine, has died and Harold Westerling has become the new Lord Commander. Kind of funny how they're talking about Ryan Redwine whilst we see red wine being poured. The Triarchy and the Three Cities? What are you talking about, Carlos? The Triarchy is composed of the Three Cities of Lys, Mir and Tyrosh. Weren't you listening when I said this in my previous video? Harold puts the House Karen figure in the centre, yet next we see it, it's more to the left. Absolutely shoddy work, the entire show is ruined now. No, poor Kristen doesn't have a squire to hold a banner of his sigil for him. It's incredibly obvious that Rhaenyra is attracted to Kristen, but she's not wrong though about it being best to name someone with actual combat experience to the Kingsguard, rather than knights who have only fought in turnies, even if those knights come from great houses. Visenya Targaryen made this painfully clear to her brother husband, King Aegon Targaryen I, when she was able to cut his cheek with her sword Dark Sister before his guards could even react. Thus, she created the Kingsguard and personally chose the seven who would protect the king, rather than holding a turn to decide who was worthy enough, as Aegon wanted to do. Viserys says at the height of their power the Valyrians had 1,000 dragons. No such number is ever given in the book, the highest we ever hear of is the 300 the Valyrians used against the Rhoyna, the incident which made Princess Nymeria flee across the narrow sea with her Rhoyna in 10,000 ships, as Rhaenyra mentioned in the previous episode. It is possible though in the 600 years between that war and the Doom of Valyria that enough dragons had been born to number 1,000. Ah, so Rhaenyra is still 15, not yet 16, despite the timeline increase of 7 years and her being 9 at the time of her mother's death in Fire and Blood. We get our first look at the exterior and interior of the Grand Grand Sept, as if you recall me mentioning in my previous video, the Great Sept of Baylor has yet to be built. Oh, I listen to you sly girl, you, getting Rhaenyra to say she doesn't think you feeling close to your dead mum in the Sept is foolish so that she then can't refuse to try it herself without seeming like a hypocrite. Come on man, just let her talk, you've named her your heir, how are you going to know she's going to be a good enough ruler if you don't hear her out? Praise her when she comes up with good ideas and give constructive criticism to her bad ideas so that she'll learn. Not listening to your daughter and heir isn't just bad parenting, it's also bad kinging. What did I tell you last time Viserys? Getting cut by the Iron Throne is not good. We see what's happened to his finger, but I wonder what's happened to the cut on his back. As Lena mentions here, and as I mentioned in my previous video, Viserys was the last person to ever fly Beleriand on the Black Dread before the dragon's death. Viserys at first planned to fly the dragon to Dragonstone, but the beast was so old and knackered, Viserys instead only flew him three times around King's Landing. It's funny Lena brings up Vagar, the dragon initially belonged to Visenya Targaryen, that eventually became the Mount of Balon the Brave, Viserys' father, and now, according to Fire and Blood, the dragon should at this point already be the mount of Lena here, who became a dragon rider before the age of 12. Just like Alicent, Lena also hasn't been aged up like the other characters have and is 12 here in the show just as she is in Fire and Blood. This could also explain why it was between Viserys and Rhaenys as to who would be named Jaehaerys' heir rather than between Viserys and Collis and Rhaenys' son Laenor, as Laenor being one year younger than Lena wouldn't have been born yet at the time of the Great Council. This is assuming Laenor hasn't been aged up like his sister and is still 11 in the show because to me he appears older than her when we see him in the first episode, so he could possibly have been aged up and so still could have been born at the time of the Great Council and actually be Carlos and Rhaenys' firstborn instead of Lena. Was anyone else reminded of Danny when Rhaenyra says when she's queen she'll create a new order? You're gonna break the wheel, princess? Oh, how 200 years makes a difference. Men would rather burn down the Seven Kingdoms rather than let a woman rule? Rhaenys, I'd like you to meet someone. Her name is Cersei. Some nice symbolism going on here. Viserys is a broken dragon and here comes young Alicent showing how she could fix him. Though it makes me wonder if it actually was her idea to have the dragon fixed. Her father is the one who pushed her into hanging out with Viserys. It might have also been his idea to have the dragon fixed and have her present it as a gift. Though polygamy wasn't so much a Targaryen tradition, rather just a thing that happens sometimes, 
such as Aegon the First wedding both his sisters, the act of placing a dragon egg in a baby's cradle was very much a tradition, and if the dragon hatched it usually became that child's mount later in life. Daemon's trying really hard to piss his brother off, stealing the egg chosen by Rhaenyra to have been placed in Balon's cradle to now place beside his own child, an egg belonging to the dragon Dreamfire, and as such, could be a sibling to Danny's dragons. In 54 AC, a woman named Alyssa Farman stole three dragon's eggs, which may have been Dreamfires when she departed from Dragonstone. Alyssa took the eggs to Essos and sold them to the Sea Lord of Bravos for a significant amount of gold, which she then used to have a ship called the Sunchaser built and to hire a crew so that she could sail west of Westeros in an attempt to discover new lands and riches. King Jaehaerys Targaryen I feared the hatching of these eggs and the rise of dragon laws in the east, not of House Targaryen, but Grand Maester Benefer believed the eggs may not hatch away from the heat of Dragonstone and would eventually just turn to stone. Your daughter's self-harming because she ain't as happy as you think she should be, Otto, you dumbass. I really wanted to see the front of this ship because goddamn that dragon figurehead that looks crazy cool. Ah, uh, Dragonstone, looking just as ever like a knockoff Baradur. Because of her differing skin colour in Fire and Blood, I wonder if Missaria might have been given white clothing in the show so that she could still maybe be given the nickname of White Worm by her rivals and enemies, though it isn't a very effective insult if she can just change the clothes that aren't white. This confrontation between Daemon and Otto doesn't happen in Fire and Blood. Upon hearing what his brother was planning to do, Viserys just sends threats to Daemon, who follows the commands of his king to do everything which Otto tells him to do here. Also, in the previous episode, Viserys never told Daemon to leave King's Landing. Daemon was just so mad at Rhaenyra being named heir instead of him, he left of his own accord in anger. Does the Kingsguard armour remind anyone else of the armour worn by the Necromongers in the Chronicles of Riddick, or is it just me? Wow, Kristen's got some big balls to speak to Daemon like he does, reminding him about the turning incident where he beat Daemon at both the joust and the fight that happened after. In fact, Daemon Daemon here hasn't said an unkind word to anyone, and yet here's Otto telling him the king doesn't see him as important enough to come himself, and calls Daemon's love a whore to his face, and Kristen rubs his victory over Daemon in his face just because he got his name wrong. You can see in Daemon's face how much Otto's words hurt him concerning his brother. Harold even reacts to Otto's words like, was that really necessary? Poor Daemon. Otto addresses the men with Daemon as the city watch, but can you really call them that since they're not watching over the city like they're supposed to? How are they even here? If they're here, who's back in King's Landing keeping the King's peace? Did Viserys appoint a new commander who assembled a new force of gold cloaks? Uh oh, you've done it now Otto, here comes Caraxis, the blood worm. Did he not know Daemon had his dragon with him and that's why he didn't come with a way to fight it? This really makes Otto seem either incredibly confident in his own ability to talk Daemon down, or pretty stupid to not anticipate Daemon using Caraxis. It's a good job Rhaenyra decided to fly Cyrax here to bail Otto out, or he would have had to go all the way back to King's Landing having failed in his mission. We learn Daemon was lying about Missaria being pregnant, though Fire and Blood states she was actually pregnant and later miscarried the child. With Fire and Blood being written as an in-universe history book, however, it may be that the information contained within concerning Missaria having been pregnant could have been unreliable. Yep, as Lord Strong says of Viserys, House Velaryon is currently the wealthiest house in Westeros, not the Lannisters of Castle Rock, nor the High Towers of Old Town. Collis' wealth primarily comes from the amount of voyages he has made to the east and the exotic and expensive goods he procured there and the profits he made from them back in Westeros. How does it feel, Viserys? You took away Emma's choice of whether she wanted to sacrifice herself or not and made it for her, losing her as a result, and now you have to deal with the consequences and not having the choice of whether to remarry or not. Your small council and the realm is making the choice for you that you have to. Ain't nothing like a nice heart to heart between father and daughter where they both agree their dead wife slash mother would be all for Viserys getting remarried and pumping out more kids. Oh, the joys of being a royal family. I like how Carlis looks so pleased with himself when Viserys announces he's going to remarry. Are you not the least bit curious as to why Otto's daughter is present for this small council meeting, Carlis? So I guess it's now that Carlis quits his position on the small council with Viserys not choosing his daughter to marry, instead of when King Jaharis didn't choose Rhaenys to be his new heir, when his additional heir of Aemon died and instead chose his other son, Balon. I don't blame Rhaenyra for being upset, it's Alicent who's been pushing for her to accept that the king has to remarry, and now that Viserys has declared he's going to marry Alicent, Rhaenyra's probably thinking this has been Alicent's plan all along. I mean she accepted that the king had to remarry for the good of the realm, and the best marriage for the realm would be Viserys marrying Lena. But with Viserys choosing to marry Alicent out of love, Rhaenyra must understandably feel betrayed by the two people closest to her. Corlys mentions to Daemon how some texts say House Velaryon is actually older than House Targaryen, 
Though he doesn't mention like Fire and Blood does that House Velaryon also apparently came to Westeros before House Targaryen did, which would then make them an older family than the Targaryens in both Old Valyria and Westeros. So I turned out to be right in that the writers had the triarchy form now rather than many years ago to make them more of an immediate plot point as it appears Daemon and Corlys will join together to take on the crab feeder. I like how even now, after everything that's happened between him and Viserys, Daemon still sticks up for his brother when Corlys starts badmouthing the king. As he said in the first episode, the blood of the dragon runs thick. So is this meant to be Kragus the crab feeder Jahar? Not what I was expecting him to look like, but I can't deny he does look quite cool and scary. So those were all my thoughts on the second episode of the first season of House of the Dragon, The Rogue Prince. If you think I missed anything important or interesting, put it in a comment below along with your own thoughts on the episode. My most liked part of the episode goes to Viserys deciding to not marry a 12 year old girl. Thank the gods. And my most disliked part of the episode goes to seeing all those crabs eating people. No thank you show, I really did not need to see that. Thank you all so much for watching, if you have any advice on what I could do better for the next video, please leave it in a comment below. Don't forget to like, subscribe, ring that bell and follow me on Twitter at triple s underscore YouTube. I'm also on Odyssey at triple s colon 83, so follow me on there if that's where you prefer to watch videos. Thank you again for watching, and I shall see you all next time. Good. Bye.